But the weird thing about that and a few other stories that have done really well is that they'll get shared in Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, the UK, Europe. And it's really weird people sharing it saying, yeah, this is true. This is exactly what's happening here. Because a lot of the stuff that I write is Australian centric. And then people say, oh, replace Australia with New Zealand and that's it. Or replace Australia with Canada and that's what's going on. And you realize that what we're experiencing is exactly what's happening in basically every Western country around the world. We have a lot of the same problems. Welcome to the New Flesh podcast, the podcast you deserve. My name is Ricky Olpike and joining me is the dystopian Jonathan Astro. How are you? Hey. I'm very good, thank you. Can can a person be dystopian? I don't know. It just popped into my head. Imagine that. Like I'm dystopian. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think I feel like I've met some dystopian people. Um, yeah. Over the over you know the lockdown period, bad old there, days. There is a strange allure of dystopia. I think. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, you you you. I mean, you watch Blade Runner and. You know things like that, and and it's it's shitty, but you want it. Yeah, you want it, but you know, I think it. Do you think it would be the same if it was in Smellovision? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you could smell Blade Runner while you were watching it. Yeah, because New York yeah. stinks. You know what I mean? Yeah. And New York's not even not Blade Runner. So uh, I'm just saying, uh, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry about about all of that. But uh, yeah, no, it's a it's a bizarre thing, dystopia. I don't know. Well, but we, you know, we got our wish in the end. Like, you know, actually, I remember saying that um, when Trump won, because for a mm. while there, uh, we got the dystopian president that we always wanted. Because we all of the movies when we were a kid had a guy like Trump like running, that, yeah. running things. Yeah. And then he eventually was running things. I was like, oh, wow, there you go. And then, yeah. you know, during 2020, maybe this will come up in tonight's discussion. Uh, but 2020, I really did feel that was dystopia. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Burning and then, and then, cities and in And then America. the lockdowns, you know, lockdowns. and Lockdowns. Uh, yeah. Actually, it's starting early. I, do you know we stay away from lockdowns and COVID? The dear listener, have you noticed this? We don't really – we did put the ban hammer on this a while ago. And it's because I get too worked up about it or too – it hits me deep. Yeah. We, we talked about it a lot in the early days. And we've had some guests on to, to talk exclusively about it. But, yeah. yeah, we've sort of cooled our heels on that. There's enough of that going around, I think. But we probably will. It'll come up today. I know. And I feel like, you know, just sound like a cooker. <laughs> like, I don't know what this time, what that, what, that, what that means really, but I hear it and I, I know. I'm told, I, I'm getting the feeling it's not something you need, you want to be. No. Well, maybe we should ask our guest tonight, John Goddard, what a cooker actually even is. Yes. Is he a cooker? Is he living the cooker lifestyle? <laughs> we'll ask him, see if, see if uh, he appreciates that line of questioning. Don't, maybe we'll open with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe we will. Well, before we get on to the interview, we need your help here at The New Flash. We need you to leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to the show. We're also on YouTube, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a comment about the show you liked or perhaps one that you didn't, maybe this one. Word of mouth is also a very powerful tool, so please tell all of your friends. And finally, to our Uber fans, if you love what we do, you can send us a little cash via the Buy Me a Coffee platform. Any donation here is very much appreciated. Now, on with the show. John Goddard is a fast fiction writer and polemicist. His short stories are dystopian vignettes of not-so-distant futures where citizens are taxed at 80%, state-mandated euthanasia is the leading cause of death, and digital dollars are destined to enslave the populace. John has grown an online following for being a proponent of libertarian ideas. He frequently publishes his writing on X, uh, which is where he first came to our attention, and he's here to talk about his fiction and life in Melbourne and Australia more broadly. John, welcome to The New Flesh. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm glad to be here. Well, I've got a question. Uh, this isn't. This isn't. I'm not implying anything by this because we, I genuinely don't know. But uh, uh, what? What is a cooker? And what? Do, <laughs> why do people say this word? Why have I not heard this word? And now it seems to be ubiquitous amongst a certain sort of person. What? What, what is this? Have you heard this? I've seen it on Twitter. You actually surprised me with this because I don't really know what it is. But I'm like relatively new to this whole Twitter thing. I only got on it like six months ago and I feel like it's a Twitter word that I guess left-wing people use to describe right-wing people. Um, But I guess it's more than that. I guess like a cooker is probably like a conspiracy theorist and a, uh, you know, like anti-vax, pro-Trump, you know, in that basket of um, ideologies, I think. So, yeah. but I I actually think, I think it's a class thing too because a cooker is a certain class of person, a wor- usually a working class person who, like you say, is, is, is anti-vax or 
you know, anti-mandate at least. And uh, the implication like, is that they've gone. They probably went to the, some one of the rallies in. That's right. Yeah. Oh, it's probably something. one of those dumb, uh, dumb no voters that what's his face while Lead Ali was talking about <laughs> uneducated <laughs> no voters. Oh, I hate them. <laughs> Fucking dumb idiots ruining uh, our democracy. Yeah. Yes. Uh, not good. Well, I think further research pending maybe on the uh, definition of a cooker. Well, one of our favourite questions is what we ask a few of our uh, guests actually is, what do you think of the ABC? Uh, the ABC, I don't know. I don't get around the ABC that much. I don't understand why we pay for it. I think it probably served a purpose back in the day when there were a handful of media stations. Um, but I think it is ideologically possessed. Like what, From what I can tell, but I don't really watch that much of it, but I used to. Do you know anyone who does watch it now? Uh, or listen I mean, to it. I know people that I can guess watch it, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know for sure. I'm not in their living room, like seeing what they're tuned into. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure people watch it. It seems like a. Uh, it seems like people think it's a trusted source of news because it has like a a good brand, I guess, from what I can tell. But I don't know. Oh well, I only ask because I I, I still know a few baby boomers and a few people around who are who are pretty plugged in that they're watching it like it's 2001 Uh, dear listener if you're from overseas we're we're again talking about a national broadcaster the abc sort of like a pbs in 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 america and um yeah i I just know some people who seem to uh yeah be listening or watching like it's 2001 and um so it's a to me that's a different brand Uh, i feel like they've gone um they've become uh Niche, quite niche. Like I watch. It's. Un, I we were talking to Julie Sago and a journalist recently, and um, yeah, as I said to her, I find it um, completely unwatchable, unlistenable. And I mean, the great examples of recent times. They had that. Um, uh, what was it? The 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 coronation. Was it the coronation where they? Yes. They, so yeah. their coverage of the coronation. Let's face it. It's so people can tune in, see the pageantry, see the carriage, golden carriages, and stuff. And they they got a bunch of um, ideologues on a panel to. <laughs> We were all talking about colonialism and stuff, weren't they? But but they were just talking over the whole thing, you know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So ruining it and with the wrong stuff. Yeah. I don't understand why it exists. Um, it seems like a mouthpiece for some sort of government agenda, I think. Um, did you guys see that one in um, the UK? I think it was. And there was a group of people looking at, I think, the women's like UK soccer team or something. They're like, oh, just terribly white. Terribly, terribly white soccer team. And it's like, what the fuck? Like, these are girls just out there trying to play soccer. And yeah. you're like upset at this color of their skin. And they're from the UK, which I think at one point in time was a predominantly white country. But yeah. Mm. But but it's never the other way, though. I mean, they, they'd never look at a, a football team, a soccer team, or let, I mean, let's take the NBA, for instance, which is like, what, 95% black. I mean, no one looks at that and goes, oh, how come we don't have equal representation here? You know, then then it's based on merit, you see. Yeah. It's bizarre. I feel like it's I feel bizarre. like this is this is uh, this is fertile ground and won't cause any controversy. Uh, we've we'll just been saying, Ricky. <laughs> yes. Well, perhaps let's move on to Melbourne. John, do you do you live in Melbourne? Is that is that where you're based? No, I used to, and I left uh, during COVID because I mean, for obvious reasons. Oh, you lucky man. Well, I I moved I moved to Perth. Uh, moved from Perth to Melbourne around 11 years ago, and I didn't really notice the extreme wokery until about 2018, 2019, uh, which is, you know, you left shortly after that. But when did you first notice that you couldn't read JP's 12 Rules for Life on the 86 tram without copying abuse? (laughs) My old housemate um, was this girl who was doing her PhD in, like, feminism at RMIT, and she would post um, photos when that book came out, 12 Rules for Life. She would post photos on Instagram when that book came out, basically being like, we need to censor this. I can't believe it's on um, you know, the bookshelves in Australia. And I can remember seeing that Instagram photo while I was listening to a podcast of him inside my house when she was also in the house. <laughs> Oh, and I actually really liked her a lot. Like we got along well. Like this is the thing. I just like you know you get along well with people, but having these like crazy different views and whatnot. I think she knew that we like didn't see eye to eye, and I just made jokes about it. But I remember there being a time when that was because uh, I lived in Mel- Melbourne for you know about ten years, uh, and 
I remember, you know, that was, you could have a difference of opinion or, or you know, there, we all had a sort of a soft left um, consensus about things and it was fine. And, and, yeah, you knew people who were, like, yeah, it was relegated to your housemate who, yeah, who studies some niche postmodern stuff and it, that's where it was sectioned off to and it was fine. But we're talking about there's a shift that occurred somewhere along the line where it, it now it is, um, I don't know, like one of these places that um, uh, um, has a m- militant uh, and a very, very um, zealous left-wing radical base, you know, uh, where all the mads, I mean, I lived in, you know, Yarra uh, Council and that is the that was probably, that might just be the wokest council in Australia. Bro, I was in Northcote. Ricky, where were you? Or where uh, are well, you? Wh- well, I'm I'm in Heidelberg at the moment, yeah, but but nice. I lived I lived in Northcote for five years. Yeah, I lived I lived behind the Wesley Ant. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's a good spot. I was down in Westgarth um, for most of it, and then I moved up a bit further up Northcote towards the end. Um, but I love North. Like this is the thing I love Melbourne so much, and like leaving it and then going back to visit it, which is when I wrote that thing that you're referring to with the '86 tram. Going back to visit it, it was just uh, like absolutely devastating. Seeing all my favorite um, cafes had shut down. I went out to dinner at this place, spent 250 bucks on a dinner, which was horrific. All the buildings are falling down. Everyone looks sad. They've just been inside forever. I don't know. It's just not a. It's not good what they've done to that place, which was, in my opinion, the best city in Australia. We all obviously liked it. Like, like I mean, I, I moved there. To me, it was... Um, I don't know. It was a magical move. Like I was just, I dream, you know, because I visited in, you know, the very early aughts and I was just like, wow, like someone took me to, yeah, you know, Fitzroy and it was just the coolest place ever, you know. And then um, I, I, uh, and and Ricky must have had a similar experience. Like this, we're three guys that that were in love with this place. And then now I honestly, you know, I actually have to come back and, and, you know, uh, see, a friend's baby and um you know catch up with my uh, my friends and ricky included and um i'm kind of not looking forward to to, to going back to, to, to you know um it's it, this is yeah. a terrible situation well what was your trip like when you went back recently it was horrible no actually i always have a good time when i'm in melbourne it was just distressed like it was what i saw caused me to write that thing that you're referring to and um it just seems like they're defeated. And I've got family and stuff in Melbourne still. Um, and it seems like everyone's defeated there. Um, they're, the state's completely bankrupt. They just put up with a government that just wastes money on like very obvious corruption. Like the Commonwealth Games thing is very, very obvious corruption to me anyway, as well as all the other projects that have shut down that they never could have funded. And people just put up with it. Um, I read a story about someone who has a like a property investor right he's got one one rental property it's a house that he rents out to a family it brings in 18 grand a year and now with the new taxes the taxes on it are 19 grand a year and it's like how can you do that i I read a story about some guy i follow on twitter who bought a block of land out in the countryside and he bought it because he can't afford to build a house on it now, but it's somewhere where he wants to live in the future. Now that's getting taxed every year. I don't know how people are living there, to be honest. Well, uh, why do you think people are putting up with it? Because we did have an opportunity to vote out the current Labor government. And although they didn't, you know, they didn't didn't uh, rollick in in terms of, you know, winning winning the election, but people just sort of plod along doing the same old thing, voting for the same people, like... I had this exact conversation yesterday with a guy, Alex James, on Twitter. We have this conversation a lot, actually. And I think, to me, it seems like the Australian psyche, like the psyche of the average Australian has been so beaten down from decades of governments taking away rights from them inch by inch by inch that they're in a place where there's a complete apathy to um, very obvious totalitarian moves by the government. It's like absolutely crazy. It makes me like really upset. I mean, every day I go to work, I work, I'm a lawyer, I go to work in a law firm and everyone just is there. They're like, oh, I spent this much on groceries this weekend. My fuel is this much. And I'm in a law firm. You know what I mean? These lawyers are earning like more money than most, more money than the average person. And they're saying that the cost of living has gone crazy and they're just like, we can't do anything about it. So that's what I think. That's why I think. Yeah. Well, my wife went to a cafe today to catch up with a friend of hers and there was nothing there on the menu let to eat less than twenty two dollars, 
and she just didn't eat anything. She just had coffee and then had lunch at home. Like that's, I mean, that, 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 that's the lowest thing you could get was like $22, which is crazy. But b yeah. before we leave Melbourne behind, like I, 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 in the conversation that is, you know, for me, Melbourne really broke my heart during the pandemic years because, you know, I was shocked to see how callous people were towards their fellow Melburnians that were clearly hurting during the, during the lockdowns, you know, blue collar workers, families in small apartments, people with sick and dying relatives, kids and teenagers who missed out on schooling, basically anyone who wasn't part of the, the laptop class were, were just treated like scum, you know, if they voiced their opposition to lockdowns. And, you know, that, that really broke my heart. Do you think, what do you think COVID's taught us about, about Melbourne or Australia in, at, at large? I don't know how to say it, but um, seeing what you just said absolutely broke my heart. All the people that rioted against being locked up in their houses and having their ability to feed their families take it away from them. I was proud of those people and I thought that was an amazing thing for them to do. And seeing the backlash on TV, like these people are crazy because what, they don't want to be sitting at home like thinking, how do I survive the next few months? I saw people, like I know people that had to sell their houses because their businesses went under. Um, and it was completely unnecessary and it was obvious that it was unnecessary after a couple of months. Like I could understand the first um, little bit, you know, when COVID was coming to Australia, we were like, oh, you know, you get those videos of um, morgues in the street of New York and stuff. Like, it was scary. And then after a while, you saw that people got it and most people survived and it was nothing. And it was like, all right, why are we locked up inside? And you see Queensland's open. New South Wales is open. You know, they had some weird rules and stuff, but everyone was open. That's why I came to Adelaide. Adelaide was open. Mm. So, yeah, we didn't learn anything. Yeah. Well, the, the, the pushback, the pushback I always hear is like, oh, we just didn't know. We just didn't know. And my, my answer to that is, well, when did we know, though? You know, like, was it after a month, two months, three months? Did we ever alter our plan based on you know, the, the incoming evidence. No, we didn't. We, we plotted, plotted along, especially in Melbourne, you know, for the longest lockdowns in, in the world. And, you know, it's, and we're seeing, we're seeing the effects of that in terms of kids schooling and, you know, the spike in excess deaths that, that, you know, the cookers, the cooker would, I was would say, you sound like the a average cooker. cooker. I, mean, I don't know what a cooker is, but you sound like a cooker. <laughs> the average cooker would say that was due to the vaccines, but I, I think it's to do with misdiagnosis of cancers and, and people not getting access to, to, to health services early, early on to screen those sorts of things out. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just a total clusterfuck. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy, man. Like, I just don't know. And this, th this is the thing. Like, I think the media played such a huge role in it because every single day you had these, um, this like scoreboard of deaths and everyone was tuned in every day looking at the deaths and there was this panic building up and the media built that panic up on purpose. And we could see like, if you look at some of the other countries over the sea, overseas or some States in America that weren't locking down, like you could actually see that it wasn't actually that bad there, but the media just shut all that conversation down. They're like, no, mm -hmm. look at our scoreboard. Look at how many deaths there are. Stay in your house. Shut up. Be scared. I, it was so bad. It was so bad. Well, you know, it, you're, you're a storyteller, John, uh, as evidenced by by uh, your work, which we'll, we'll get into soon. But perhaps you could start by telling us a, a little bit about your story, you know, fill in the gaps for us. Because we we saw you on Twitter. We liked what you do, but we know next to nothing about you, really. So, Oh, yeah. I mean, there's not too much to know, right? Um, I think, uh, where do I start? Like, obviously, I'm a lawyer. I've got a law degree, an economics degree. Um, and I think the, the main reason I got on Twitter was because, you know, I saw all this nonsense going on in the world and I got to a point where it was like, uh, what do I do? Do I live my life not saying the things that I want to say or do I take a bit of a risk and say some things that might be controversial? Um, and so I started writing on Twitter and that was only six months ago. And so um, it's I've got some pretty good support from that, which has been really nice. Um and I think that, yeah, I'm going to say something that isn't related to the question that you asked, but um, I heard this quote today that um, perfectly sums up kind of the decision that I made to start writing stuff on Twitter. It's from this movie called Ready Player One. And the kid says, um, or he says, I'm sick of sitting in my tiny corner of nowhere uh, defending my little sliver of nothing or something like that. And it's like a lot of people are just sitting there scared being like, oh, what happens if I lose my job that pays me 80 grand a year? Like what does happen? You probably find a new job, probably a better job. Um, and so, yeah, I was just worried about sharing what I thought and, and I did it.
Um, but yeah, is there anything in, in particular that you wanted to know? I'm sorry, I know I didn't really talk about my backstory then, but <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> no, I'm interested because it, you know, well, I think the most interesting thing is that you know this is it's six months in, and and you know, uh, you know uh, obviously you're doing things now that seven months ago were inconceivable. You know, you're taught you're writing stuff, putting it out there, uh, you're going on on you know on podcasts you're doing twitter spaces getting in spats with people you're doing like this is all fairly different to to uh, what you were doing before i mean and 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 six months feels like fairly recent very recent yeah man that's the thing actually when you guys messaged me i was like oh yeah i'll go on your podcast it's fine and then i started looking up your guests i was like what why are you having me on here <laughs> <laughs> well, well, interesting interesting yeah you no, guys have some uh, really cool guests actually so props to you Thank you. Well, you you write fast fiction, and yes. before we get into breaking all that down, would you mind reading us one of your pieces? Yeah, of course, no doubt. I'll read one. Um, I have two. All right, I'll read a story that I wrote in August um, called Wrong Think, and this is the one, this is not my personal favourite, but this is the crowd favourite that got shared and liked the most. So uh, it's called Wrong Think. I just got fired for Wrong Think. Then I found out that my bank account's been frozen too. I try to get an Uber back home, but no cars will pick me up. How did Uber find out I committed wrong thing? I check my phone and apparently I've been banned from Instagram for the same reason. Then a social worker knocks on my door and takes my son from me. They tell me I've endangered my son by exposing him to wrong thing. The state will now house and re-educate him, ensuring that he is only exposed to government approved facts. I feel my heart rate increase. I try to turn some lights on, but it looks like my power has been disconnected. I remember that I have some cash upstairs, so I decide to use that to buy some food whilst my bank accounts are frozen. But the grocery store tells me that it can't accept cash, so now I can't even buy food. I think I have some vague recollections of people warning me about the dangers of a cashless society. I call all my friends for help, but none of them want to talk to me. They've all been warned about my wrong think. They know that if they talk to me on the phone for too long, they'll get punished as well. I call the police to see if they can help me. They say no, but I'm referred to a government-approved mental support officer. I tell her my situation and she listens carefully. Once I'm done, I hear the officer get extremely excited. She tells me that the government has a new solution that they're trialling for people in my situation, a euthanasia care package. She says it's my best option. The best thing is that it's $0 up front. They just charge a 58% tax on my estate. I ask if there are any other options, because this seems a bit heavy handed to be honest. But she says that euthanasia is perfect for people like me. She stresses that it's a voluntary decision, but then after that adds that the government will continue to deny me services until I opt into the euthanasia care package. I sit on the floor of my living room in despair. How could all of this happen to me? And just because I noticed that the TV was telling me lies? I didn't even break any laws. These days it seems that there's one set of rules for the people who repeat what the news tells them and another set of rules for the people who speak out about the continuous stream of inconsistencies and outright lies that we're force-fed every day at 6pm. And these lies coming from the TV seem so obvious to me. So I wonder how people don't notice them. Why won't they say anything? And then after a while, I realise that they must notice them, but they've been forced to ignore their own eyes by this machinery of coercion. You see, governments, media and corporations are now so interconnected globally that they can move in unison to unperson anyone who doesn't say that 2 plus 2 equals 5. And so I was unpersoned for wrong thing, because if I'd committed a crime, but I wasn't tried by a court, I was tried by this new judicial system, where there's no evidence, no trial, and no judge, just a verdict and a punishment. Yeah, that's it. Nice. It actually, it it, it made me think of, uh, just on the euthanasia topic of a, we we did an interview with uh, Stephen Edgington from... uh, the Telegraph in the UK, and he's he's gone over to Canada to explore the uh, euthanasia situation over there. And he he told a story about a woman who has been waiting six years to try and get this ramp, a wheelchair ramp, in her in her house. And for whatever reason, the bureaucracy keeps kind of handballing her from place to place, and she can't get this ramp that she really needs. And someone in that bureaucracy suggested, "Have you ever thought of the MAID program, which is uh, the assisted dying program there?" Which was one of the most shocking things I've I've heard uh, a guest talk about. Really, the the idea that rather than getting a ramp installed in your house, that you might 
decide to euthanize it's a futurama joke i keep saying that but it's like like that that's totally straight out of futurama and we we used to laugh at that and go (laughs) oh they're the suicide suicide boots right yeah Yeah. they'd never be suicide boots and this is what we're talking about yeah that's right i forgot about the suicide booths (laughs) that was a good joke i remember laughing at that but yeah there's some uh, absolutely crazy stories coming out of canada about this and Uh, everybody that talks about euthanasia perhaps being a bad thing in Australia gets told that they're wrong. And uh, the front page of, well, I don't know if there's front page of the newspaper, but I've seen multiple stories um, in the newspaper in Australia, like, um, you know, treating people that are euthanizing themselves as heroes. Um, and so they're really glorifying it. And that is like, very worrying to me. You have to ask why that's happening. And if you ask why that's happening, that's a weird rabbit hole to go down. I mean, you can say like, yeah, sure. Um, You know, there's empathetic reasons or altruistic reasons. And yeah, maybe in a small percent of cases there are. Um, But yeah, you get um, overzealous people suggesting Mm -hmm. it to everyone. Why are they doing that? I don't know. So that piece that you read out, that that, that is the one that, uh, you know, has obviously been shared a bunch of times. Uh, You know, maybe tell us about some of the reactions and, 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 you know, Perhaps you could uh, have a guess as to why, um, a guesstimation as to, as to why this, this seems to have resonated with people. I actually have no idea, to be honest. I don't know why I got shared as much as it did. Um, I think most of the reactions were positive. I try not to read uh, too much like comments or anything like that on um, the thing. But the weird thing about that and a few other stories that have done really well is that they get shared from people in like every country. Well, not every country, but, you know, um, They'll get shared in Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, the UK, Europe. Um, And it's really weird people sharing it saying, yeah, this is true. This is exactly what's happening here. Because a lot of the stuff that I write is Australian centric. And then people will say, oh, replace Australia with New Zealand and that's it. Or replace Australia with Canada and that's what's going on. And you realize that, um, oh, I didn't actually realize until I started doing that. I wasn't confronted with the fact that what we're experiencing is exactly what's happening in basically every Western country around the world. We have a lot of the same problems, so I found that really interesting. Yeah, and and I know you said you didn't, you don't like to look at the criticisms, but has has there been much criticism to that particular piece? I don't think to that one. No, I think the most criticised piece was actually the tweet that I made about Melbourne, which is the tweet that turned into that lo- uh, longer graphic novel that I wrote. Because people in Melbourne do not like it when you pay their city out; <laughs> they yeah, just don't that's at all. True. They yeah. absolutely lost it. Um, yeah. I don't think I've ever received so many negative comments. Uh, I did another one about Melbourne University as well, which riled a lot of people up. Why are they so hot about it? I don't get it. Like, because I mean, if Melbourne's so great and if it's the most livable city, and if your uni's so great and free speech lives there and whatever, and you're proud of it, then what's why? Why do you care about what someone's saying on Twitter? Bro, well, what do you think would happen if you paid out Kim Jong Un on Twitter and a North Korean Reddit? Or well, you paid out North Korea on Twitter, they'd lose it. They'd be like, no, our country's the best. It has to be the best. Don't say anything bad about it. That's what I think it is. <laughs> they're in this like weird little Stockholm syndrome bubble where they're like, no, it is perfect. You cannot shine light on the fact that we're trapped in a prison that we put ourselves in. Hmm. Well, you you say you write fast fiction. What, what are some of the features of, of fast fiction? So... I don't think fast fiction is a real thing that exists, but I called it that because I thought it sounded fun. Um, but I write, mostly I share my stuff on Twitter. So uh, I write stuff that's between like 300 and 800 uh, words. Um, and they're just short stories that you can, um, you know, digest in a bite-sized way. So I post one every couple of days and, and do it that way. Um, I'm kind of, well, I'm not kind of, I actually use that as a way to develop ideas for a book that I'm writing. And so I'm kind of like working through ideas and it's a really good way to do it on Twitter because you get all this feedback uh, kind of immediately on your ideas and you can like iterate them. So most of my pieces I have copied into a Word document that I flesh out longer and it's uh, turning into a longer book. Well, there's a great uh, t- a tweet that you did uh, very recently and I love this. It's a provocative uh, idea. You say, fiction is more persuasive than nonfiction and in some ways it's more true than nonfiction. That's why I write stories instead of essays. End of tweet. <laughs> A provocation. Would you elaborate? Mike, drop. Um, no, because I'm thinking I wrote that because I have this thought that I was actually fleshing out in a space yesterday as well. I um, am try- I, I was trying to figure out why 
I think the way I do and why other think other people think the way they do. In particular, why people would arrive at the conclusion that communism is the correct pathway forward as opposed to capitalism or why totalitarianism is the correct way forward as opposed to libertarianism. And I reached the conclusion that the reason that I uh, tend to more towards capitalism and libertarianism is because of the fiction that I read when I was a, a teenager. Um, so that's kind of what I was thinking when I thought that, but it's true, man. Like you read a story, like I'm re- rereading 1984 at the moment and I can't understand how anyone could read that book and then not be completely um, uh, terrified of the things that our governments are doing to us now. I just don't understand how that is. And the so there's thing a, with that yeah. book, though, sorry, is that the 1984, unfortunately, it, it seems to be a bit of a, I don't know, it's a bit of a, uh, like a shapeshifter. It seems like both sides read it. And respond to it, and 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 and. Do you well, find one side this? says one side says it's all Trump, yes. and the other side says yes, no. it's true. Like yeah. people, I've seen people go, "Oh, it's exactly like 1984," and then the other person's like, "Yeah, I am right," you know. Yeah, Trump. So I don't know. I don't know what to do anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's still great, but I love it. Yeah, know? well, that's an interesting thing, right? And I think why uh, dystopian fiction is so popular is because it, um, I think society's kind of on the brink of dystopia at all times and either the left or the right can lead to dystopia. And if you're untrusting of the left or the right, you will probably see that in either side. And to be honest, I can see how people would see that in Donald Trump. Um, He has the potential. I mean, I don't actually think this, but I could see how someone would think that he has the potential to become like a dictator type figure. Um. And, you know, how he was saying fake news and all that at the start, even though the news is fake, um, but if it wasn't fake and he was trying to tell people that it was fake, maybe that would be 1984-esque. So I can kind of see both arguments. Um, And it's important to realize that, yeah, the extremes of everything is bad. (laughs) It's bad. Mm. Well, I I think it's interesting, uh, you know, you said you you decided to do fiction rather than essays. I. I don't think you would have gained such a following as quickly as you had if you were just writing essays like a lot of other uh, people sort of comment, commenting on this space. And I think also people wouldn't be as su- wouldn't be so hot under the collar about it either. I think I don't know. I think fiction has a way of t- of, t- of of touching a nerve of of really holding up, you know, a, a a lantern to to the truth in a way. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And you'll actually notice, uh, you, you won't notice because you won't be able to go there, but the first like four or five things I wrote on my Substack were essays, no one read them. Then I started writing a couple of stories and it, uh, yeah, exactly what you said. It kind of pushed a button, yeah. especially like I wrote a lot of really like um, provocative satirical type pieces as well. And it, people just go, oh my God, mm. you're you're paying me out. You're paying out my side. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> well, also I think also I think it's 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 a symptom of the fact that we're sort of starved of art, really. I mean, no one we should be making artworks about our times and about our troubles and about our fears and worries and the the, the current situation that we're in. But we're we're not really getting that. We're just sort of getting a lot of surface stuff, a lot of movies about diversity, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of remakes, reboots, uh, you know, superhero movies. We're not getting the kind of uh, fiction or, or movies that we loved from the 1970s, like like Taxi Driver, for instance. You know, those sorts of movies uh, sort of are tapping more into this dystopian worldview. Do you think? Do you think people are starved of art? Yeah, that fries my brain. I've written something about it before. I started a piece saying all the stories have been told and all the lessons have been learnt. And uh, it's true. And I think in that I said, you know, I'm watching the 14th remake of Thor while people are trying to um, make communism a thing. Um, And it's so true. Like all people are doing is just rehashing these old stories, except they'll make the cast diverse. And then people are like, well, what is this? Like I need some good stories that actually reflect what's happening. And then you get something like that Oliver Anthony dude who just says what he thinks is happening right now and people really resonate with it. Um, And it's bizarre because artists, I think, always were the way that – what are they meant to be? Like a mirror to the world. And, I mean, the only art form that really does that is comedy at the moment as far as I can tell because – 
most other forms of art are kind of hijacked with trying to push some sort of moral agenda. Mm. But but even with comedy, like you have to be uh, of a certain level to be able to make that sort of commentary. Like someone like Dave Chappelle, who's uncancelable, can say, you know, for instance, stuff about trans people or, you know, some of the other ideology that's around there. Like if you were starting out today in comedy, I think it'd be very hard to 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 make the kind of commentary that that someone like a Dave Chappelle could. Yeah, man. I don't know. I don't know. Starting out in comedy makes me feel anxious. I don't know how people do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing with comedy is like you you have to learn your craft somehow. You have to try out your material somewhere. I mean, comics are famous. Bomb. You have yep. to bomb as well, yeah. And comics are famous for trying out their shit at, at small clubs and stuff, you know. I mean, and if you – if your stuff has to be completely polished before you can even like start out, like that, that's not. Are you gonna saying happen. that like Michael Richards had a whole set planned and that he was just trying some stuff out and he could <laughs> and someone filmed it yeah. and then I mean we were robbed of what could have been a great hour long special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I get it. Uh, that has to be not. the case. So, John, uh, do you have any? You mentioned, uh, you know, reading fiction growing up. Do you have any literary or creative influences uh, on on your work? You know, writers or artists or anything like uh, that. Well, the person that's influenced the way that I write the most most is Brett Easton Ellis, and the first book that I tried to write was basically a copy of uh, Less Than Zero, which is his first book. Um, and I just love his books. Like, I'm nowhere near as good at writing as him, and we write about different topics and different things. But I just think he's I, he's my favorite uh, writer. Um, what else? And to be honest, I don't read a lot of fiction. Like I stopped reading fiction, I think, when TV started, you know, when TV shows started happening, which was when I was probably in like grade 11, I think. I started watching Prison Break was the first series I watched. And ever since then, like I haven't read any fiction, which I think is really sad. Um, but during school, you know, I loved like Fahrenheit 451, um, Ayn Rand, George Orwell, and – those sorts of things. And I think those are what, um, yeah, shaped my beliefs about a lot of things. Mm. So glad cool. to hear you mentioned Brett Easton Ellis. Yeah. He's such yeah. a G American man. Psycho like is a masterpiece. American Psycho is incredible. Glamorama, I think, is my favorite book of his. It's just like you read it and it's just, it's so good. It's so funny and it's so well written. Um, yeah. Yeah. I can recommend the, well, have you read the um, uh, Imperial Bedrooms, the follow up to uh, uh, Lesson Zero? No, I haven't read that. I should read it. You should. It. It's a short read. It yeah. won't take long. And um, it is uh, obviously Lesson Zero is a masterwork. Uh, you know, for, for, it's just he had the muse. This is a different thing, but I found it very, very interesting. So I recommend right. that. Oh, I'm going to read it for sure. Well, he's just the coolest writer ever. I wish we. I wish people were walking around talking about novelists and talking mm. about cool dangerous interesting novelists like I always pine for the last great you know i mean we'd have some people who might come at us and say oh there's been some good eras in the last 20 years and you go oh, fuck off like we're talking about in the 90s we had like you know you had train spotting and and american psycho infinite jesse it was like these epic you know paradigm shifting things and you would walk around you know people would be have a well thumbed copy of it, you know, and be passing yeah. it round and stuff. Like I, I don't know. I just I yearn for this this time. It's uh, now we're just doom scrolling and we don't read books. Yeah. Well, did you read? Uh, I can't believe I can't remember the name of it. But Joaquin Phoenix was in this movie, um, probably mid twenty teens, like twenty fifteen, twenty sixteen, and he plays. It's set in the sixties. He plays a cop that smokes a lot of weed. And it's this whole story and it's an amazing movie and it's based on a book that was written in like 2012, 2014 and I read the book and I forget its name and it's really, really good. So I think that's a modern piece of fiction that's great but like I wouldn't have heard about it if there wasn't a movie about it. That's the thing. Mm. True. Yep. Yeah, well, actually I saw as well. Did you guys see on Twitter recently there was this photo of a man who had his arm on the armrest and this – lady posted a photo being like, why do men think they can take over the armrest? Yes, yes, I saw that. Uh, I, <laughs> seen that yeah. I saw that, Bro, yes. I clicked on her for profile for uh, her profile and it turned out it was the um, the lady who organises Adelaide Writers Week or something. So she's like a director of Adelaide Writers Week or something. And then I was going through her profile and 
Um, so I think it's pretty obvious why we don't have good novelists because they're all like, <laughs> I think they're all just going to be like <laughs> hardcore feminists. I don't know. Can I say that? <laughs> I think they're going to write shit shit things and i'm in adelaide i've never been to adelaide or i speak i look at the people who speak there all the time i'm like why would i go to hear these people talk well i think that yeah, just clear, it's an interesting you know we, since we do have a lot of feminists to come on the show uh i think well, what, actually no, yeah well, sorry I, sorry I, sorry no 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 what i'm saying is that i would say because we talked about we talk about this a lot like if you're going to be a good novelist you can't be any kind of ist really because you know the whole point of being an artist is you need to understand humans and the human condition and get inside so i i think i could happily talk to any of the 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 the, the feminists or radical as you like and say well you know you, you know you're not going to write a great piece of fiction if you're uh compromised if you're writing a political uh you know a, a piece like that it's it, it's got to be something that transcends politics uh in my opinion i mean what do, what do you think of something like that john i think that's correct and when i say feminists i I don't know. I mean, because I see you guys have seen some, uh, had some ladies on here who I really respect, like um, like Angie Jones and stuff like that, who are actually like standing up for women's rights, unlike a lot of other. You mean women. liberal liberal feminists? Uh, yeah, kind of, uh... yeah, yeah. But I'm talking about like the blue haired crazies that will just be like, ah, all men need to die. Um, but you made a really interesting point, and that's probably the one criticism that I would make of Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand is that it's um, the content is good, but I think the story took second place to. Um, the political message, and so you can't let the your your political rant get in the way of the story. And she did that in Atlas Shrugged, which I think is like the the downfall of that book. So you're right. Well, I still haven't finished Atlas, Atlas Shrugged. I'm embarrassed, um, but I tell you what, I've read The Fountainhead a bunch of times, and uh, it's an incredible uh, work. And I think you can read that with no knowledge of uh, objectivism or any of her stuff and 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 feel something. That's the difference. You feel something. I mean, you know, Atlas Shrugged is moody, but, I mean, it's just coming on too strong, you know. She's just – she's being too strict with herself. She should let the – you know, let herself go on the page. Oh, yeah, and it's really long, man. Like, fair enough if you don't get to the end. <laughs> like, it's so many pages. <laughs> I just looked up that, uh, that uh, book that I was talking about. It's called Inherent Vice. Oh, Pynchon. Thomas Pynchon. Yes. Yes. I, I thought it was great. I've, I've read that book twice. Read. I mean, that's, and that's Paul Thomas Anderson uh, movie. So he's, he's um, legendary director. Yeah. So yeah. he's good too. Well, you're, you're quite a regular on Twitter spaces. I guess we should call it X spaces now, yeah. which, which for our listeners is, is a newish feature on Twitter in which you can host group discussions on whatever you like. Now, I, I was listening in on one you hosted recently with a, a, an overzealous detractor of yours. The exchange you had was, was extremely frustrating. It, this guy was, was accusing you of being basically a right-wing extremist and nothing you could say would change his mind. And it, it really wasn't a good faith discussion, really. And this guy got so hot under the collar about your fiction writing. You know, he's lost his mind over it, which on one level is great because I wish art still had that that power to rile people up but on another level it's it's a bit scary you know as this guy clearly wants to get you cancelled and i believe he he dobbed you into the cops for something Is yeah he correct? reported me to the police for inciting racial violence which i don't think i did and this is the issue that i had with it i'm so glad that you uh witnessed that because it wasn't recorded and i'm so upset that it wasn't recorded um because heaps of people asked the recording and stuff afterwards and it was just you know, it was a train wreck it was very bizarre occurrence but that guy was commenting on every post that i made just like all the time he'd comment saying um horrendous things not even like a good criticism like fair enough if you just write like i don't like this for this reason but um yeah he just wrote hor horrendous stuff and so i messaged him one day just saying are you okay man like why uh, do you feel the need to go out and <laughs> write these things and he was like you're a fascist i know that you're a fascist i can tell you line by line why you're a fascist and any time, any place, I'll tell you line by line what is wrong with you and what is wrong with your ideology. And I was like, all right, fine. Well, let's, um, that's cool. Let's do that. Uh, hopefully, I can learn something out of it. And yeah, we scheduled the space. And it was very bizarre. Very, very bizarre. Uh, I don't know. It, I can't really remember how it went. But I, yeah, we just said, so what's, which, what did I say where? And he didn't really say anything where. He just kind of said a bunch of stuff that I've never said before and just like worked himself up into a tiz and then like, Went off into the what sunset. are you meant to do though? Because uh, I was listening too, and and um, 
Uh, I was so fascinated by by the medium, by the discussion. I mean, you know, it kept me entertained. Like, like spaces is quite a new thing. So I'd like to get your opinion on, you know, spaces and that kind of format of, of for anyone who's not on Twitter listening, it's like a group discussion thing that you can just pop do a pop up group discussion and uh, and you know you can sort of moderate it a little bit. But this one was, it just seemed like there are so many instances now where this happens where two people were talking and, um, you know, I thought you guys did did a great job in trying to find some sort of uh, I don't know way to get through, but. This guy was just not on the same planet, you know. And it's, and if we're not on the same planet, how can we? Uh, if we can't agree on basic things, how how can we um, get through some of this crazy stuff that we've been talking about? Yeah, I love spaces. I think spaces is why Twitter is better than any other social media platform because every other social media platform is you're kind of shouting out to the void what you think. Maybe someone will comment back, and then you get into an argument with them in the comments, which is not productive. Um, but on Twitter, you can, um, yeah, just start a space and even not for arguing, like, I, I mean, I don't make a habit of making them for arguments. Um, there's a bunch of dudes out there who just host regular spaces and they're not for anything other than for everyday people to come together and share their thoughts on things. And so I think it's actually, um, I don't know, I've, and I've tuned into a bunch of them and I've spoken to a, to a bunch of people in them and it's almost like a place where people can talk about things that they're not usually allowed to talk about in their day-to-day lives. And I think it's a really healthy kind of space. I mean, sometimes they can be not healthy, but that's why you've got to have a good moderator in there to stop people who just start doing crazy stuff because sometimes people do get emotional and stuff. But uh, there's two people who run good ones. One is uh, Mick at McCamius. Um, and the other one is Preston Henshaw, who I think is at Preston Henshaw one. And they kind of like um, do a really good job of trying to host um, really, uh, what's the word? Like respectful political discussions between people, just like average Australian people, which is what we need more than ever, I think. Well, one thing that really struck me about this guy was that he was so literal in terms of like reading your artwork and and reading your stories that... And it's something I've seen in the left more more general generally is that they're so they're so literal about art and about comedy. You know, they just it, you know it's it, it, art is not supposed to be literal. You know, it's 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 supposed to be uh, you know it's supposed to be a lot of things, I guess, but 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 prov- provocative and it's supposed to be um, you know it's supposed to inhabit a different sort of sort of space, but. Yeah, this guy. I don't know why. Why is why why is this a thing? Why 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 are people on the left so literal these days? When they used to be, you know, the artists. You know, you think of artists and you think of the left. Yeah, that was bizarre. Actually, I remember that because yeah, I, in that particular piece that he took issue with, I said the enemy, and he was like, "Well, who's the enemy? Who is this actual exact person who you're talking about?" And I was like, "Bro, there's no person. <laughs> there's no person. <laughs> it's all these ideas that I think are not good, and that's why I wrote the thing about them." Like, what? But, but, but it would be like going back in time, and when someone says, "You know, oh, geez, you know, you just can't, uh, you can't do anything about the man," and then you saying, "The man, hey, who's the man? Tell me which exact man is it? Tell yeah, me yeah. about this man. <laughs> Who is the man? Where does the man live?" And the people go, "Man, it's, you're the man," because you're asking those questions. Yeah, yeah, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. But I think there's this thing. It's like, what is it? Like the oppression Olympics. Um, and also, there's this cir- uh, thing that I've no- noticed in academic circles. So I'm uh, doing a master's degree at the University of Melbourne in law, which is the epicenter of all this psychotic nonsense. And it's like if you can find racism or um, you know any sort of ism within something, then you've got an academic essay, and then you write your academic essay, and the circle of academics clap for you and say, "Look, you found it. You found this is the things they look for. It's like or yeah, racism or like any sort of in- inequality or anything. If you can find that." If you look hard enough and find that, you've got yourself a good mark at your university essay. And that dude was, yeah. They are so desperate to find this boogeyman. Like I I was driving past uh, the Preston train station the other day and they had this huge 
poster that someone had had stuck on one of the pillars there for, for the overpass of the train. And and it was some rally that, that they were encouraging people to attend to, to stop Nazis in Melbourne. You know, come to the Stop Nazis rally in Melbourne. I'm like, what? Like the, the 10 Nazis that kind of live around here? Like, you know, I mean, you're out of your goddamn mind. Like they I've so got you beat. desperately want I've got, I've got you beat. In Petersham here, uh, not too far from our house, there's a... Uh, there's signs up, like street signs in that street sign fashion, bright red that say racism not welcome or something like that. Or not, racism free. <laughs> oh, is, is, is that the one that looks like a street sign? Like, yes. And you, you know, go, like is this Smith, racism Smith not street. welcome street? Yeah. Like it, and they're around. And this is a, you know, it's not an area that's got a race problem, like at all. Like it's inner city Sydney. You know, it's it, it's probably it's it. There probably is a diversity problem. It's probably more more white people around there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, I think that's the underlying people. message of all that stuff, isn't it? It's like, well, we're not diverse enough. That means we need less white people. I literally, I had a county court judge say to a lecture that I was in or a tutorial that I was in, we want less white private school educated men in the legal profession. She just said that. I was just like, why? I, I I think I think there should be less university educated people in law, <laughs> because law actually used to be a, more of a trade. You wouldn't go to university to learn law. You would you would go to a law firm and learn law. That's probably a great idea. <laughs> it's probably a great <laughs> idea because you don't actually learn anything uh, during uni. You just spend a whole lot of money and you come out of it completely unprepared, like. Nobody that comes out of university knows how to practice law. They don't know anything about the world. They're just like these just brainwashed little people. Do, do you see much of the uh, activist class at you know in your law circles? Like have you seen – because, I mean, the worry, I guess, is people have said that, oh, well, you know, uh, the younger generations of, of, you know, law students or whatever are – are radical progressives so much so that they're that that, that that'll inform they'll, they're going to pack the you know the sort of the um that whole profession later and then that'll start to you know yeah the legal profession is gone it's completely gone i i, I have to be a little bit careful about what i say um and who i criticize because i have mm. professional obligations and i don't want to lose my practicing certificate it sounds I need it. delicious by the way go <laughs> on <laughs> but it's it's it's, but it's completely gone it, it's just just it is it's uh it is uh so far left leaning particularly in the law societies uh the courts all the major law firms um and i've been trying to figure out why that is actually like a lot of people would find that surprising, but I think for the big law firms, I know why it is because they need to get government work and to get government work, you have to have a certain, you know, you have to tick certain boxes. Um, we spoke about this with Richard Hanania. Uh, mm. This is what his book Origins of Woke is all about. He he talks about civil yeah. rights law is the is the the thing that's driving and has driven wokeness, if we can use that word for a very, very long time, decades and decades, and it's not a bunch of niche academics sort of being unleashed out of out of the university suddenly. It's actually baked in, and what you just said is one of the main reasons. He says that everyone in America works for the government, like in some capacity, and therefore there's just all of these, um, uh, you know, if you talk about the carrot and the stick, there's all these sticks that are set up to sort of get you doing affirmative action, get you doing all these different things. I mean, what, what do you think of that sort of idea? Yeah, that's 100% it. Um, and it's very weird that you said um, everyone in America works for the government. So in Australia, you guys probably saw, I think the biggest employer that we have is the government in Australia. And that's direct employment. That doesn't count all of the people that are, someone described it to me the other day as like suckling at the teat of the government. So all the big law firms that do all, all their work that they overcharge for and most of it is superfluous. I know because I've done government work um, at a law firm. Um, consultants, accounting firms, all of these industries that just rely on getting government work um, to do basically nothing. I mean, I think it's all corruption to be honest um, because they can't justify – I don't see how the amount of money spent on – 
that the government spends is justified and there is no recourse. There's no way to go and audit everything and actually be like, hang on, you guys didn't do the right thing here. So there should be some recourse. It's not, it's not possible. Um, for example, Dan Andrews spent $600 million on absolutely nothing with the Commonwealth Games. No recourse, nothing. Um, if you contrast that with the responsibilities and duties that are placed on directors of companies, very, very strict liabilities, very, very strict duties. If you don't pay super, they'll sell your house and then bankrupt you and pay the proceeds out. If you do the wrong thing as a business owner, you have strict liability, but um, in the government, there's absolutely no liability. So it's very bizarre, no accountability. And it's our money, right? Like they, they at one point, the government worked for the people and then it flipped. And so now the government, the people are working for the government. It's, it's, they refer to it as a kleptocracy. So, and that's how I feel like every Western system is operating. The people are just there to put out effort, create value, and then it's taxed. It's taxed on income. It's taxed on capital gains. It's taxed on consumption, alcohol, fuel, GST. Uh, it's taxed on payroll. It's taxed everywhere. And it's absolutely bizarre. Sorry. Bequeathments, so even like oh, at the end of life, that's tax bro, as well. Estate tax has to be the most egregious one of them all. It's like you worked really hard all your life so you could give something to your kids. And guess what? We all deserve it because we live in a communist regime. Everyone gets to share in everything that you did. Even the people who've spent their entire life on welfare and done fuck all for their entire lives, they get a part of your estate. You know, it just doesn't make it's. Oh, I know I've gone off on a massive tangent, but I get fired up about this stuff when I think about how much um, waste is on the government and then how many corporations are reliant on government intervention. I mean, even Qantas, right? So they're not directly reliant on the government for work, even though they do fly a lot of politicians around. But it's so clear that their business strategy is to get in bed with the government and then have the government create a monopoly for them. It's like it's so far removed from capitalism, free market, that it's, I think it's completely egregious. Now we're the ones that suffer. We suffer through inflation. We suffer through um, high prices. I don't like it. Well, I mean, we might as well follow it through. Do you feel like some of this, uh, um, you know, because it sort of feeds into some of the cost of living stuff we we're talking about as well. I mean, we just had a highly, uh, I don't know, an expensive referendum. Uh, do you feel like that some of this stuff all packaged together might have might have contributed to Oh, uh, 60% of people saying no thanks? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I sure do. I think a lot of people just looked at it and they were like, what is happening? Why? Is that 500 million? I forget. Someone uh, worked out how many uh, homeless people that could have fed. And yeah. it was, you know, every homeless person in Australia for a couple of years. Mm. Uh, it's a big spend. It was a big spend. Um, and when you add up all the waste, I mean, all the waste that's been public, if you add all that up, it's egregious. And then I think there's a lot of waste that isn't public. I mean, there are people working at government agencies on 900 grand a year. You don't even know who they are. Not elected. Just some random person who got a government job. In Sydney, they're advertising for a truth teller for 360K. I saw this. Yes. This is for Chris, this is for the, oh. uh, Chris Minns, the, the premier, yeah. right? Yeah. And I mean, if that's not, what are they calling that? Calling that voice by stealth. Yes. So it's, 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 it, 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 it's, it's interesting. You, it's interesting you bring up that article. That that I posted that article on the uh, Australian politics subreddit today, and it got uh, it got taken down. It got taken down. What? Oh, I don't know if you've dipped your toe into Reddit. I've 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 tried uh, as you know, sort of. I I thought Reddit might be you know sort of a platform where we might be able to have discussion and and maybe grow the podcast, grow our audience or something. But it is an absolute work cesspool. All I get is and- Ricky sending me these these screen caps of him getting banned and and kicked out <laughs> and the, these snarky messages from these mods. And, and, and this is not me sharing stuff. Pro- provoking I'm, them. Like, yeah, you're not prov- I'm, not, I, I'm not sharing stuff from Infowars. I'm sharing stuff from legitimate web, Australian news websites, you know, and yeah. they either get, they either get um, locked, which is, which is a thing you can do on Reddit where, where you lock the conversation where people can't comment on your post anymore, or, or it gets outright banned for some sort of reason. But there's one great response they keep sending, which is, uh, this might be in the politics one, the one where they say there have been many other, there's, there, there've been other posts like this. Yes. So, 
So it could be the biggest issue of the day and what they're basically saying is, oh, come on, just, you know, we've heard this, oh, more yeah. about this and you just go, this is a, uh, this yeah. is politics, this is the biggest issue that we're talking yes. about a referendum, the referendum's happening, everyone's been banging on about it and you're acting like this one particular thing I'm, 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 I'm posting is, oh, that's too much, let's move on, let's, this, this other stuff that's happened, you know? Yes. Yeah, and it's just some like loser sitting in his basement being like, hey, I'm going to change the outcome of the <laughs> referendum. <laughs> but uh, I went on Reddit a little bit um, and I realized that they were all retarded when I went to the um, the financial advice part of Reddit. That's when I looked at it and I was like, <laughs> all right. Because their whole thing is like, um, what is it? And they, they kind of buy into like that fire mentality, which makes sense. You do need assets to give you an income so that you can um, prosper in your old age, right? But they're like, mm, I got down my cost of living to $11 a week by eating cat food. And then I invested that into a diversified fund. And then I survived. <laughs> I was like, that's no life to live. Like what advice are you giving to people? You got to go L- out life and like, hacks. have a, yeah, it's not a good life hack. Like you got to, um, you know, you can't be done with your money, but like, what are you telling people to do? Like I saw one dude, he's like living on a boat by himself, 60 on a boat by himself he's like i never had kids i never had a wife and now i say he saved everything for so long and now he's like yes and now i've got my cost of living down to ten thousand dollars a year by living on this little boat and i'm happy now and i was like you are not happy my friend you need a family you need some friends you need some hobbies i don't know what the fuck you're doing by a boat on yourself you weirdo who's Uh, by the way if you hit your head coming up out of the you know the lower deck uh who's there to do anything about that, my son, you mm. know? Just Redditors, man, and you're in trouble if you got Redditors <laughs> to save you. <laughs> well, I thought, I thought the saving grace of Reddit might be your less political uh, places. Like, uh, I, I'm a classical music fan, so I follow the classical music subreddit, and I've even had stuff banned from that because I, I, I posted, uh, you know, one example is I posted about a, a piece I've discovered by Arnold Schoenberg, uh, which is a survivor from Warsaw, which is sort of like a tribute to 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 the Holocaust. It's one of the first musical tributes to that atrocity. And uh, I, I just posted a thing going, oh, I've discovered this thing. Who else has heard it? It's great. And I posted a picture with that particular comment of the front cover of the orchestral score. And it was taken down because my post was too clickbaity as, you know, the picture didn't add anything or, or I didn't comment directly on the picture that I've posted. What do you meant to say? So, this is this is the cover to the score. It has notes on it as they are the notes of the music. But but again, again, so literal. Like, you know, my, sure, my post didn't, didn't uh, directly reference that page of the score, but if you're interested in that topic and you go, oh, isn't it fascinating to see the front cover of a handwritten score from Arnold Schoenberg from 1946 or whatever, when it, whenever it was written? Isn't, that what know, the inter- isn't this what the internet was made for? Like what you just said, like creating, like, you know, doing what, kind of what we're doing now, which is, interfacing you know sharing stories ideas getting you know getting with it and 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 that it feels like people have just created these these little ant hills with yeah. all of these uh separate kingdoms that they want to control and then they go no no that's you can't say those things just stop it. Well, I, th- I think I think people who become moderators of subreddit groups have that sort of streak in them where they like the authoritarian kind of way that they can go about it, you know. But but I definitely think Reddit is definitely fertile ground for your for your writing, you know. So maybe dip your toe back in if you can stand it. <laughs> yeah, I might. I might throw it in there and see what they say. That'd actually kind of be funny, probably. <laughs> probably be funny. But this is the thing, like the um. The, uh, the internet is a really good uh, way to describe what I was saying before, where we're either like, we're kind of always on the precipice of totalitarianism, or one thing can be two things at once. The internet is either going to free information completely, make it democratic and accessible to everyone, or it's going to enslave us. And it feels like it's going to enslave us, probably, because everything is censored. And it's absolutely crazy how difficult it is to get information. Google changes the front page of everything. I saw someone post yesterday um, and they're in America. If you Google pregnancy, the first thing that comes up is planned parenthood. It's the first, first return. And it's like, what are they like? What? 
what are they doing? And um, I, I, I've gotten to the stage where I can't trust the search results. So I go to Google to look something up and then I'll also go to DuckDuckGo to see duck, if they're duck, like mucking at the front page. Yeah. You know, yeah, DuckDuckGo is the fucking way to go. <laughs> it's so <laughs> shit to use, but it's like, well, but at least they're not duck, duck, But using DuckDuckGo is the equivalent of eating boiled cabbage <laughs> <laughs> for dinner. <It's, laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I suppose on some level it's better for you, but... Bro, it's, it's the tough. default browser on my phone. I know it. Don't my, I know mine it. too. Mine too. No, but it's it the, sounds yeah. like you've gone you've gone through some struggles. I saw you mentioned on another uh, interview that, that you had tried to live without an iPhone. Now, you know, DuckDuckGo, you've already mentioned two things which I've, uh, I've attempted. Um, I, I feel like I am enslaved by the technology... Uh, by the attention it grabs from me. I think I was more interesting uh, when I didn't have it in my life. Um, I hate how much time I waste scrolling. I hate, um, uh, you know, I kind of, I, I love the people that, the, that, we, that we follow on Twitter and all our followers and all that, but I hate Twitter and I'm on it all the time, scrolling when I could be reading. Uh, and, and so I've taken measures. I mean, have, is this an active thing? Have you tried to, to, go, to, to take your life back, your attention back and, and in, in any of these ways? Yeah, it's a constant battle and focus is what you need to get things done, right? Um, uh, I mean, you guys obviously have output, so you know what it's like. You actually have to sit there and concentrate on one thing for an extended period of time in order to get anything done. And if you're distracted by a phone that's popping up and like there's there's benefit to it, like you said, you, Twitter, you can connect with people um and yeah your phone has so much information and fun stuff to do on it but you have but to people focus. hassle me like they, like there's this there's this constant you know even people my de- nearest and dearest and and whoever like you ha- like you'll work somewhere and they they force you to get whatsapp because they go oh well we've got this group on whatsapp yeah. and then so i get whatsapp and then i hate it because it's just another thing and whatever and then i put in the thing that i've got it on mute and everyone's hassling me they're all like oh why have you got it on mute stop that like i'm a business like i work for them you know? Yeah, my yeah. Wife. My wife. No, yeah. Honest. You have to time block, man. You just have to time block. I think that's the only way to do it. You respond to emails at a certain time. You look at your phone at a certain time. You do work at a certain time. Mm-hmm. And you have to be strict about it. Um, but yeah, I've tried to live without a phone, and I wish I could, but I just you can't. It's not possible. Uh, Astro, are you? Do you still have the dumb phone? That, that I you do, but I, I I must say it was psychedelic. I used it for like two days, uh, <laughs> and it was absolutely psychedelic. Like, like in terms of the effect it had on my, my life and everything. Like, like going on the train and yeah, I'm not saying I, 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 I just took out my Kindle and read my Kindle instead of doing whatever. I, I didn't scroll and whatever. And like, I, and I feel like um, I desperately want to want to do this. Like, it's just this is not working out for me. All this stuff, you know, especially now. Like a calamity happens in the Middle East, and I spend. 24 hours when I was just living my life, I spent 24 hours looking at the most horrendous stuff. By the way, which we used to have to go to Rotten.com and Death Faces and yeah. Live Leak. Like, we used to have to go there to do that. Now, everyone's- it comes that's to been, us. That's been mainstream. <laughs> like, 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 all of that stuff's been mainstreamed now. If normal normies are like, oh, this is horrible. And I'm like, yeah, I know. We used to do this, like, late at night because we were in cell- Losers <laughs> who were doing this, and we knew it was not a good thing. And now we're just doing it. Everyone's doing it. Your neighbor's doing it. Looking, oh, did you see that Hamas video of the person shooting up the, you know, the the bunker? And you go, oh, goodness. Yeah, it's there. It's there. Yeah, you can't. I mean, it's. I don't know. There's no. I don't know what the solution is, but you just can't. This. Uh, oh, do you know what I was listening to? A podcast this morning where the person was talking about this. It's Chris Williamson. So he's got the Modern Wisdom pos- Podcast, which I love. And it was one of those episodes where he's talking through a bunch of stuff that um, he has learned over the podcast that um, he does. And he said that he's playing with some new idea or some new test to tell whether the content that you're consuming is positive for you or not, because we're mm. all like consuming content all day. Mm. And I think the actual consumption of content probably isn't a bad thing unless it's distracting you from more important tasks. But the consumption on content is on its own isn't bad. If you're consuming stuff that's positive for your life or you're learning, like you're reading a book or something, that's good. Um, but if you're watching, yeah, the crazy, I mean, I try to get rid of all that war stuff off my feed. Like that is crazy. So uh, he had some test for it. I can't remember what the test is. So that story kind of had no point, but 
Um, well, no, I know his. No, I know his channel. I'll try and find that because that sounds very interesting. It's All I most, know. Yeah. Now you go. Oh yeah, it's in the most recent. Um, well, he just did a new video for seven hundred episodes, so it's in that one. All I know is that in the last few days, um, you know, I managed to, you know, get into that the the final Beatles track, and I watched the documentary, and I listened to the song a bunch of times, and I've been, you know, I just bought a little a book on on John Lennon. Uh, you know, to have a read of that. And just the few, the little bit of time I spent doing all of that, I feel has enriched me in a way that all of this culture war shit, uh, you know, doesn't. And 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 I feel like um, I don't want to go back to the time when uh, I could never go back to the, when we were completely apolitical and I was just thinking about John Mayer and, and isn't daughter <laughs> such a beautiful son? And it is. Um, you know, but, but I feel like I want to claim back some of that ground if it is like a you know a map i uh, uh, you know i feel like the red the, i feel like you know the kaiser has taken over a lot of the map and i want to take back some of it with with good enriching stuff i want to think about the beatles i want to think about good songwriting and listen to all of that you know and and not uh just be caught up in this this doom loop what do you guys think yeah do it bro do it bro i think less time on twitter is good i changed i flicked because it was like I was getting, I was posting stuff on Twitter and getting followers on Twitter. I thought that I had to be on Twitter, and I flipped the script in my head. I was like, "Well, Microsoft Word is actually the app that I should be using." Um, so that's what works for me. Well, that's why why we encourage people to watch good films. Uh, mm -hmm. We we used to do a movie review on this podcast once a week as well, where we tried to encourage people to 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 dip their toe into cl to classic cinema because that that's far more enriching than. Uh, being on your phone and and doom scrolling. Yeah, I just watched um one flew over the cuckoo's nest last weekend or the weekend before. Oh, amazing! Wow, but that you know, interesting you say that movie for the director uh, Milos Forman. He felt to him that that movie was a, a, a an allegory or an outlet for his experience growing up and and experiencing the Soviet, um, you know. Uh, way of life and, and the oppression that you feel and that the hopelessness that you feel isn't that don't you think we should have and they never mentioned that in the film they never they, it was not like you know mcmurphy never said geez this is exactly like you know the the soviets uh you know it's terrible isn't it you know uh, go, they would mm, today they'd remake yes. it and it'd be oh it's totally like like when trump came well, down the stairs <laughs> yeah. you know well, there'd be so much that would be different. I feel like, you know, I don't know, the character of Chief, I feel like, would be yes. would play a bigger part. He would take <laughs> he over would the place. He would be the main role. Somehow. He would be. He'd probably end up buying the place and whatever and doing something. But um, so anyway, the, the point I'm making is that, you know, to put a bow on this thing we're saying about art, maybe, and you're doing this, you're creating, you're being, maybe that's what I'm saying. You're being generative. Do you think that this is something that maybe small people should do is that you, you're not just sitting down and, and critiquing other people's work and, and, and doom scrolling. You're, you're generating new, new content. And when you, when you flicked over into doing that, uh, did you notice any change in, in, in your life or your thinking? Yeah, hundred percent. You have to be creating, not consuming. Um, and people that it's like it's so easy to critique things. It's really easy to pull something apart and point out what's wrong with it. But it's a lot more difficult to actually make something of your own. Um, and that was actually something in that argument that you brought up before that I got in with that dude um, at the start. I was like, "What do you like? What do you do?" And he said that he wrote all the time on women's issues. And then someone during the, the session like went through his Twitter feed and couldn't find a single thing that he'd written. But that's the thing. Like if people have a problem with me and what I say, that's fine. It's all out there. Like I just, I'm writing all the time and it's all up there and you can see it. And then the people that come out and say um, things against me have never created something on of, of their own. And it's like, well, hang on. Before you go out and um, criticize others, why don't you try creating something yourself and see what happens, see how you feel, see if you actually get the urge to pull someone else down after you've tried to create your own thing because it'll probably go away. I don't feel any urge to go out and criticize other people because it's not a productive use of my time. Well, I completely agree with, with that sentiment. Um, John, we're, we're mindful of time. Uh, would you mind reading out one last piece before we wrap this thing up? Oh, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. So this is my favorite one. Um, it is, I'll just pull it up. It's my favorite one. Uh, not many other people liked it, but I don't think that really matters, does it? Because 
I guess at the end of the day, the process is what we're here for. This is called Lost in the Labyrinth. And I don't know if it's a story. It's not really like a story, but it's just kind of, kind of some words that I wrote. Um, all right, Lost in the Labyrinth. All the stories have been told and all the lessons have been learned, but we've failed to move any closer to the center of the labyrinth. Disoriented, we wander aimlessly back and forth at its entrance, failing to make any meaningful progress inward. Are we fated to repeat the same mistakes for all eternity? This question makes me claustrophobic. But as I sit here watching the 13th remake of Thor and listening to sententious academics preach the merits of communism to me, it's clear that the answer to my question is yes. We're trapped in a perpetual purgatory where there are new, no new stories, and the only strategy politicians can come up with is to run into the same brick wall, but from a different angle this time. I've read the history books. I know where that road leads. And if we really do have a duty to show God the beauty of his creation, then fully utilizing our capacity for conscious thought would be a great way to do this. But we're hindered by our consistent refusal to learn lessons from our past, insisting instead, instead to learn solely through the pain of mistake. This atavistic tendency explains why meditations is still relevant after 2,000 years. Unlike our technology, which improves rapidly, our nature is static. We're in an intellectual and spiritual deadlock. And the hubris of modern humans means that we're blind to this tendency. The harsh lessons of the 19th and 20th centuries are eschewed due to perceived irrelevance, and we're currently engaged in the wholesale destruction of the institutions with which underpin our civilization. This destruction is purportedly propitiation to new gods with which I'm not familiar. From what I can gather, there's a belief that if we appease these new gods, they will free us from some vaguely asserted oppression which supposedly characterized our past. They say that once the framework of the Western world has been dismantled, humanity will spontaneously propel forward into a new epoch characterized by morality, virtue, and abundance. But I don't buy it, and from what I can tell, society is atrophying not excelling. We haven't been to the moon in 50 years. We don't fly supersonic on Concorde anymore. We're more depressed than ever. Nobody can buy a house. There's a new tax every day. Censorship is increasing. Most marriages end in divorce. Institutions can't be trusted and our words have lost all their meaning. Everybody's aware of this accelerating degeneration, yet nobody will engage with it in any meaningful way. Instead, we're subjected to this inane public discourse, which appears to be more concerned with the obfuscation of issue issues than their resolution. I'm tired of being forced to navigate the quagmire of mindless tribalism and disingenuous doublespeak. I'm tired of being trapped inside this sterile, brutalist environment, which is seemingly designed to disconnect the individual from the divine. It's made us lose touch with the universal. And in the process, we've been deluded into believing that reality is confined to this mundane, sublunary plane. I think that's why we're lost in this metaphorical labyrinth of existence. So that's that one. That's my favorite. Awesome. Yeah, no, well, I think that's a great, great way to go out. Um, uh, I don't want to say anything about it. I just want to think about that one. So uh, a couple of things, John. Uh, one of the questions that we ask all of our guests, we'd love to know what you're reading right now. Uh, right now, I am reading the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Standard by Safe Dean uh, Amos. I think you say his name. Uh, it's a fantastic book. The first half of it is what I'm up to, and uh, it's all like classic Austrian economic theory, which is good. And I presume the next half goes into the way that Bitcoin is going to resolve the issues. I'm also reading at the same time, uh, You Can't Say That by Melinda Richards, an Australian author. Um, it's a, uh, what is it? It's dope. You guys would like it. It's basically like, I mean, the name kind of explains what it's about. It's about um, censorship in Australia. So I really like that. That, 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 yeah, that sounds really interesting. And I've, I've just got to say before we wrap it up that uh, one of my favourite pieces that I've read of yours recently is The Glass Ceiling. That one that one really hit home to me and I think I, I, I responded on Twitter about that. Um, so everybody should should jump on jump on X and, and find The Glass Ceiling as well as your your other writings there too. Yeah, I got in trouble from my wife for writing that. <laughs> she was like, well, actually you have to think about this, this and this. And I was like, I know all of that. This is just one perspective, deal with it. <laughs> I didn't say deal with it. I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. Uh, John, so people can find you on, on X uh, and uh, you have a website also. 
Yeah. Uh, so on t- Twitter slash X, my handle is non estlex, N O N E S T L E X, which is a Latin phrase. Um, my website is thejohngoddard.com, T H E J O H N G O D D A R D.com. That's it. Thanks so much, John. Thanks for the chat, guys. I appreciate it. It was fun coming on. Thank you for listening to the New Flesh Podcast. If you like our work, please consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or even writing us a review. It really does help the show reach a wider audience. We'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, long live the New Flesh.